rainbow notes are thrilled with good green shining words. With good green shining words, the true tree songs are fluted to elfin minor thirds. When apple boughs are fruited. Today I'm joined by Sharon Kraus and Justin Hopper. Uh, who are uh, appearing <coughs> in the evening session of the Thelemic Symposium coming up on the 21st of September, which is the uh, equinox, and we've got a kind of an evening entertainment and uh, performance with uh, some rituals and uh, uh, two performances, include, including yours, and who knows, maybe some other things as well, but a general social and performance space different thing um so first of all and i think i'm right in saying that your so the contribution is called or the show the performance is called swift wings before we go into the very interesting details of the show could you tell me starting with sharon a little bit about yourself uh and yeah just about yourself and what you do and what what's your main yeah. thing really so i am a musician i also um i did a doctorate in philosophy and i'm very interested in meaning and how we find or create meaning and a lot of the projects i, I work on come at questions about meaning sometimes with a magical or um sort of uh experiential phenomenological approaches and a lot of what i'm trying to do with music is is create um experiences that either i or the people i work with or the people in the audience or participants can almost have a, a sort of magical experience so that's that's an important aspect of my work I write songs, but I also what I've been doing a lot of recently, which I really love, is is working on you know projects like this with Justin, where I'm creating instrumental music that responds to um, text or you know sometimes it's images. But so so for for music to be a kind of I guess some people would use words like channeled or automatic type. Um, way of responding to you know what comes at me but it's it's the, the the kind of the freedom of you know something's something's going to affect me and then something's going to happen and that's that's what i get a lot of excitement and joy and sort of sense of real you know this is my happy place so yeah that's a little bit about me so well, now, carrying on for that, would you say that your your music and your performance then is some sort of manifestation and reflection of of the, your philosophical degree, which I think it was about uh, Henry Bergson, was who was a kind of maybe a theosoph theosophical philosopher, or certainly someone who was of interest to in the magical community. So I didn't realize. So, so the old philosophy is that th this is a manifestation of that now. Is, is that in terms of music, or this is a separate interest? It's not. It's not as straightforward as that. But it's just that I guess my what I want to say is that my music is, in a sense, an inquiry as well as just you know having fun and playing music. Okay. So well, let's go to Justin then, Justin. Uh, I don't think uh, we've we've met, or you're not familiar actually. But there you go. Maybe in another life or something. Probably have met you and have forgotten it, uh, which happens. Uh, tell me the same thing. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and your kind of interests that you bring to the to the theosophical, not theosophical, to the Thelemic movement and uh, the event that we're having in in September. Uh, yeah, my name's Justin Hopper. I'm a writer. I'm as anyone hearing this will be able to tell. I'm originally from the USA, uh -huh. um, but I live in England. <laughs> Most of my work is revolves around uh, English landscape, and um, I've written a couple of books and uh, have done spoken word projects with Sharon and others. Um, but uh, but the link here for me is that. Um, 
my, my father's British and my grandparents lived in the village of Stenning in West Sussex, which is mm. where um, the uh, poet and publisher and occultist uh, Victor Newberg lived for many years. And in that time, he operated his vine press um, publishing house, publishing small little bits of ephemera largely, but also some books of poetry and nonfiction and, uh, and a little bit of stuff that's in between all of it. Um, one of those books is Swift Wings, which I, which I've brought for show and tell. Wow, look at that. <laughs> um, but as, as many of your uh, people interested in the symposium might know, Newberg and Alistair Crowley had a, a, had a seven year sort of extremely intense relationship. And a lot of what Newberg did afterwards was in response to that relationship. So, um, so Swift Wings, while ostensibly a book of poems about the Sussex landscape, um, which is how I came to it, uh, reveals itself through you know deeper reading and and hopefully through our performances as being a kind of celebration of some kind of. I don't even want to use the word occult. Some kind of spiritual manifestation of uh of of a relationship with place that uh that comes from his from from newberg's psychic background his interest in all manner of spirituality and it's something that sort of took me in i i published a book a couple of years ago with strange attractor press called obsolete spells which is um a book of and about vine press and newberg's um contributions to the world of poetry uh both good and bad um okay. yeah and that's you know my my other work uh, you know it, it involves sort of tangentially related topics around ley lines and and stone circles and all that goodness but um but i think that's that's where i come to this uh that's where i enter the fray i suppose yeah well, I think you've always said, but who was Victor Neuberg then, or Newberg? Is it Newberg or Neuberg? It's Newberg. Right. And um, yeah, Victor Newberg was um, was a writer who was born in 1883, died in 1940. And in between, um, uh, the easiest way I always describe him is that he has three phases in his adult life. He had a phase from about 1906 or 1907 to the First World War where he was involved with Crowley, was involved with the creation of the AA, was involved with uh, publishing. That's how he entered the world of publishing, was through um, working with Ethel Archer and uh, Bunko and Crowley on, um, on publishing books and, and uh, uh, I don't know if I should say magazines, journals um, with Crowley from the Victoria uh, flat. And um, then he had a, a very, very distinct break with Crowley. They never spoke again after 1914, um, maybe a little earlier. And he went to war, came back, a slightly broken man, ended up living in Stenning in West Sussex. Um, from about 1919 until 1930, 31. And in that time, he ran this vine press. He got married. He had a child. He lived essentially his entire adult life <laughs> in this 10-year period. And then he left his wife, moved in with a woman named Rooney McLeod in London. And the two of them operated, um, well, he, he ran... So his his third phase was defined. It was very brief, but it was defined by poetry again. But it was um, defined by the fact that he ran a, um, a a piece in the Sunday Referee newspaper called Poets Corner. One of the poets that he published in that was the first ever national publication by the writer Dylan Thomas. Um, Newberg was the one who said to the world. Whoa, whoa, whoa! This guy is for real. This guy is better than all the other poets. Turned out he was right. Um, and then uh, after that, they operated a, a, um, a sort of anarchist poetry and politics <laughs> zine. I would call it a zine called mm -hmm. Comment for several years. That had a very only two years actually, but it had a very strong anti-fascist bent. They were 
you know, one of that first sort of fledgling group of London artists who were saying this, these Hitler, Franco, Mussolini people, there's something wrong with them. Um, and, uh, uh, and then he became in 1937, very, very ill. And the last two and a half years of his life was basically in bed. Um, but in along the way, you know, he remained friends with some people like Ethel Archer and Austin Osmond Spare for until the day he died. Um, his connections with the Crowley world didn't end, but his connections with Crowley very much did. So that's Victor Newberg. And at one point he wrote this beautiful book in 1922, I think it is, he published this beautiful book, Swift Wings. And uh, because I do spoken word performances, um, we wanted to find some kind of way to honor Newberg, uh, who is often remembered just as Crowley's lover or, uh, uh, or Thomas's discoverer. We wanted to honor him in some way for his own contributions. And, uh, and Sharon composed these absolutely gorgeous pieces of music for his 100-year-old book. So Sharon, do you, do, you, do you want to add anything to that? Who, how did you get into Victor Newberg? Um, and can I sort of say, because uh, we only, you, Justin just mentioned it, we, we say associated with Crowley, but maybe that's a bit coy. They were, they were lovers, weren't they? Is, is that, that, that the case? They were, it's quite intense. Yeah, I think, Go on. I think Justin did use the word lovers. <laughs> <laughs> just once. <laughs> Passing swiftly on. But the, but no, the relationship was far more than that, obviously. I mean, the relationship was, you know, Crowley, I believe, called him the most naturally gifted psychic he'd ever encountered. And, um, uh, and, and you know, and their, their relationship was extraordinary. And really, you know, it, even, you know, Sharon and I have become friends with Newberg's granddaughter, Caroline Newberg, through the course of this project. And... And even, even she, who, for reasons that some people like yourself will probably be aware of, distances herself from Crowley some bit, will we'll also say that was absolutely by far the most important relationship of his life. So it's not just that they were sexual and magical partners, they were also, you know, he, he was almost like a father figure in some ways. Newberg didn't really have a father. Uh, his father well, Crow Crowley was Newberg's father figure. Yeah, in a sort of yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think so. I mean, he's the one that taught him Rabelais and Shakespeare and you yeah. know, all these a uh, mentor then. He was his a mentor, mentor, that sounds yeah. much better. Yeah. That's but Sharon, word. let's go back to Sharon and you tell us your bit about Neuberg. How did you learn about him and what, what do you so make I, of him? I guess I, I I knew a little bit about him from from years ago. You know, before I left Oxford and when we were hanging out, and I remember you were publishing Gene Overton Fuller's biography. I read that, um, but I didn't have a you know a big sort of interest in in Newberg in particular. So it's just you know through Justin having sent me the a, a PDF of of Swift Wings. And this was, I think it was in 2020 or 2021, we were still in one of the lockdowns. So this project really appealed to me because it was something that I could lose myself in. And because, you know, a lot of the poems are ecstatic and about nature and about, you know, just the, the colors and the psychedelia found in the, in the landscape that was an enchanted garden for me at that time when you know I, I wasn't gigging much i wasn't seeing the people that i normally see on a regular basis so it was i got these poems and i just used them as as little each one was a little magic box that that let's see what let's see what comes a music box <laughs> let's see what comes out so so that's and it was it was a real delight for me to be working on on it and and i still you know whenever we perform this material i think it's you know i i think when when we first started working on it i was thinking that it might be a little bit niche a little bit too you know some of the poems are a bit kind of 
naive and maybe even a bit sort of twee or you know like oh the wonders of nature you know it it i wasn't sure whether whether people would like it yeah. other than us you know we were in the in the magical world of it so we were immersed but you know once we started performing it so the, the first i think the first performance we did was that was that the strange attractor day at, at the barbican so this was you know strange attractor press i don't know if you know them yeah, yeah so so it was a lot of people you know presenting talks about um occultists or some artists giving giving quite intense presentations and then we finished the day with this very kind of sweet um beautiful um quite innocent set of of pieces but it it was it seemed like it it, it went down really well and so there's something there's something about the material that 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 has has an impact in in its gentle kind of way i'm hoping now that i can you know we'll play a little extract a little sample of from that and insert it into the thing uh just to give people a, a taste of uh the, the kind of way the, the way you handle this material and the treatment and everything so assuming that you know what you, you just you know because i've seen the, the the film french lands
sample that you've put up there. And I, I thought it was quite an interesting technique. Do you want to kind of, that you use musically to to lay, to create this uh, layer of sound, really, which then Justin was able to kind of place the, 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 the well, word. Well, um, can you talk about okay, so, so the, the project started off as a recording project. So I was recording different instruments, you know, synths, recorders, vocals, um, some percussion, trying to think what else, dulcimer. Um, and when it came to, um, sorry, what? Voice, lots of layers of voices. Of yeah, your... layers of voice, yeah. Um, but when it came to, to thinking about it as a live performance, I had to, to try and come up with a, a way of reproducing all of those layers live. Um, but luckily, I've got a bit of gear that, that's involving a loop pedal that, that means that I can lay down one of the parts and over overlay the others. And it was surprisingly kind of fairly straightforward to to do that. I mean, so on the record, there's we've got um, another musician who, who's playing violin and viola on some of the tracks. So obviously she's not not there when we're performing. There's some bass on some of the tracks, which then I had to just kind of play on on my synth instead of Neil playing his double bass or bass guitar. Uh, there's a there's a drum solo at the end of one of the the tracks that we we can't bring bring the drummer on the you know whenever we perform just for, for 30 seconds of of him going going um so yeah so the live performance and the the record are different but that they have the same they have the same basic feel and and it's yeah i mean i guess you'll 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 you get to experience the the live version and for what it I, is. Mm. I think it's really amazing. I, I kind of love that multi-tracking type thing. If I could go back to Justin, then have you um, have you got any thoughts on on Alistair Crowley? You know that you because the event is connected with Crowley and the, what you what I would call the Thalemic movement, which is basically his started off by him. What are your what what given that you kind of absorbed all the, the Neuburg point of view or Neuburg point of view? What what did you make of Crowley then, or what do you you think of Crowley and and uh, his magic? I think that. You know, as you as you've just pointed out, my understanding of Crowley, I, I mean, I you know, I've read Richard Kaczynski's book and I have absorbed from some of the world and you know, I grew up in the eighties. You know, we, we had oh, all no. that, you know, we had <laughs> coal and ninety-three and things and yeah. so you know, I absorbed a lot of it, but um but really my only my only true sort of connection with that, the only thing that brings it to me as more than just an aspect of the 20th century popular culture that I, like everyone we know, finds fascinating, um, is through Newberg. So I have a I have a Newbergian, shall we say, <laughs> view about that, which isn't which isn't entirely positive. Um, no, no, he gave him a hard time, didn't he? Crowley <laughs> gave Newberg, he gave everybody a hard time, but I think <laughs> Newberg was, as for my point, I thought it was the best thing that happened to Crowley, the most interesting, mm. magical thing that really kind of succeeded for him, but he kind of was in denial, I think, and kind of drove him away, as he drove a lot of people, good people away from him. Yeah, He, he drove him away. He did, however, you know, Newberg... Um wrote in his defense all the way up into the 30s you know i mean he never i think that newberg's point of view may very well have been i don't want to put words into his you know into his mouth because he certainly didn't say this but um i do think that his point of view may have been that they did not work together mm. like in a really sort of severe manner they did not gel Right. However, he remained interested in 
the the magic that he learned with uh, both both alongside and through Crowley through the end of his life. And I, I, I do think that he, my point of view is always that Newberg saw poetry as magic, that mm -hmm. he saw publishing as magic, that he saw the building of a community through the use of publishing, through the use of literature, through the use of art. He saw those things as a magical act in a very sort of Austin Osmond Spare kind of way, you know, in a very kind of post not I don't know enough about this to say that kind of thing. In a you know in, in a way that diverges from but is based in that kind of magic with a K. Mm -hmm. And I do think that he maintained that fascination and that need, that compelling need to achieve those goals through his entire life. Now, I, this may sound to someone like yourself who knows much, much, much more about the subject than I do. This might sound really off base, but I always feel like after that divergence, Newberg's attitude was that magic to him was about giving power away. Mm. So he was about publishing other people. He was about enabling others. He at, at, at a great sacrifice to himself, both in terms of both financially, both socially, uh, and in the end, in terms of his health, you know, he gave and gave and gave in a way that was radical and not okay. I mean, he lost a lot. He lost his family. He lost a lot of friends because he wouldn't, he, 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 he gave everything away. And I think that in some ways that was his response to something that he might have seen as more power oriented and uh, more about accumulating. And um, I don't know, you know, I'm not... No, I think it's a fair point. That there are definitely two ways of interpreting Crowley's stuff. There's that kind of Nietzschean Lord of the Jungle power trip. But then interesting, somebody else that he, his magical son, Cro what well, Crowley considered his magical son later on, he interpreted it, the whole mythos more like Newberg's view as being about social justice and about service to a current and that true will could be about you know serving other people and serving the community so and that that's one of the more important interpretations of Crowley although it's not everybody kind of knows all the Crowley didn't completely accept that himself right he said it would be agreed that it was a valid point of view Hmm. And he realized the faults in his own interpretation, really. But Sharon, what do you, what have you got any thoughts on Crowley? You know, because back in the day, we used to do a lot of Crowley stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've not really, I've not, I've still got um, maybe three Crowley books on my shelf, you know, oh, in, right. in amongst all my other occult and magical and, pagan and tarot stuff but i haven't i haven't engaged with with crowley's thought for a, quite a long time um i so when i lived i lived in philadelphia for a couple of years sort of 2003 to 2005 and i connected with the the local oto group there but i decided i decided i wasn't going to get initiated but instead there were there, there were some people in the group that i wanted to to work with so we we ended up conducting musical magical rituals and you know there were there were some times when when i was part of a group of musicians improvising for yeah. the 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 magical work that that um the guys in 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 that um is it camp or I camp. can't remember what camp. the lodge or <laughs> oh, wait, um, anyway so yeah so I mean I, I I'm still you know I've got those yeah, connections still, still, still but but it but I'm not engaged directly with with Philema um myself I think my 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 magical work has has maybe you know like Justin was was saying about Newberg has become more to do with my creative work and the 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 connections that 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 makes and and yeah well that would, that would be 
I mean, strange. It's an emphasis side of Crowley as well that a lot of his rituals do have music in them and musicians actually working mm -hmm. in them. And I think Neu Neuberg yeah. actually danced some of the rituals, right? As when they did the rites of Eleusis mm -hmm. in Caxton Hall, he kind of went into a trance and did all this kind of, hopefully not mad uncle dancing, but some mm -hmm. something like you know. <laughs> in between so maybe the influence maybe you know who knows where that kind of idea of mm -hmm. this sort of mixed media ritual maybe mm -hmm. it, it was a new big thing as well i think that you know if, if i can jump in here the yeah first of all um the the writing at the time of, mm -hmm. of both rights of elisus and um and later on uh remarked upon newberg's in, it, genuinely sort of amazing talent as a dancer mm. which i find hilarious um <laughs> you've seen pictures of him the idea of him being a great dancer is just gorgeous but, um, <laughs> but i i would like to say that i personally strongly believe that victor newberg if he were alive today and he probably is um would love the fact that his work will be performed at this symposium. Yeah, I, well, there you go. I do think <laughs> that regardless of what happened on a personal level between the two of them, the loss of that magical community was was a really was something he the rest of his work was actually about trying to recreate uh that community. I'm having an absolute uh, brain melt here because I can't think of the name of the journal. What was the journal they worked on? Equinox, maybe. Equinox. Okay. So the Equinox was yeah. where all of those friends of his, Ethel Archer, um, Austin Osmond Spare, um, uh, uh, what's his name? The guy who married um, Iona de Forest. Um, those people remained in his circle for, you know, at, for various parts of the rest of his life, way beyond Crowley. And that circle was this deeply important thing to him that he kept dedicating poems to. He kept bringing them back into his fold. You know, he published Ethel Archer later in life. He was going to publish Austin Osmond Spare later in life when That's when Newberg died. Um, and uh, and they and they brought people in in that same way. He had a group with William McLeod called the Zoists in London in the 1930s that, I mean, is pretty easy to see that in the AA as being sort of, you know, uh, uh, tributaries of the same river. So, um, so I do think that he would really like the fact that this was bringing people together because that's what, to him, I believe, was at the root of many, many acts of his own magic. That's great. So Sharon, to finish off, is there anything before we start? You you, you made a note of things you you definitely wanted to make sure we we touched upon. Is there anything that you you wanted to add? Maybe uh, other projects going forward, or just you know things that we we, we should have talked um, about we didn't. So one one thing I'd like to add before, um, if there's anything I want to say about future projects. So as well as the two of us collaborating on this project, there's a video maker called Wendy Pye based in Brighton who made amazing visuals for the for the tracks as well which we will be projecting behind us when we perform so so that's you know it's quite an immersive visual audio combination as well um I've I've got a lovely new project starting up with with an old friend so I recently moved back to Oxford, which is, you know, it's great to reconnect with you, Mog. Um, so another another friend I've reconnected with is um, a poet, Alison Jones. You, you know Ali as well. So she and another musician and I are working together on doing something not that dissimilar to the Swift Wings project with with Ali's poems and her poems are affecting me in a similar similar way and and so that's 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 the thing i'm really excited about at the moment um i'm also doing celebrancy training so that's that's something i've been thinking about a lot you know the ways that ritual connects with all sorts of aspects of life um whether creative magical 
just you know the kind of meaning making or marking in in life so that's that's kind of where i'm at at the moment brilliant yeah. uh justin last word from you yeah i mean um i will say two things in the wrong order um i have a new one-man show coming up that uh sharon only knows a little bit about actually i should think um which is the story of a guy that you may have heard of named Derry mannering knight uh known also as this the this sussex satanist or the satanic swindler so that's a sort of folk horror comedy live show with videos and stuff that's uh so that i'm going to be touring with that a little bit doing some gigs around the country uh however the more important thing for your crowd that might be of interest and you might be hearing about for the first time now, Mog, um, is that uh, Newberg's granddaughter, Caroline Newberg, and I are relaunching the Vine Press. Wow. So um, we have a few uh, rather extraordinary book length poems that Victor Newberg wrote in the 1920s that have not only never been published, but have, we believe, she and I are the only people alive who've read them. Um, and we're gonna be publishing those uh, through a Kickstarter in September. So when people come to the symposium, we will have something for them. who knows, maybe I'll be asking, telling them all about it. But yeah, uh, <laughs> but yeah so that and, um, and Caroline's, uh, I'm also helping Caroline with her very, very in-depth biography of Newberg that she's been working on since 1984. So, um, so that should be of interest as well. Brilliant. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much, both of you, for for coming and telling us about the the show you're going to be doing for the Ceramic Symposium on in September. Uh, there'll be a detail on the the screen of a website you can go to. Anybody that's hearing this on YouTube or whatever to book tickets. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing the show. And thank you very much for coming. I'd better just say, do what thou wilt, should be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love and the world. Love and the world. <laughs> Thanks, Morg. Thanks for having thank us. You. Thanks so much. We're really looking forward to it.